So May, we met um, at like a best gay awards thing. Yeah. What? So it's the LGBT awards. Is did you win best, best gay? I didn't win best gay. I did not win best gay. I was not good. I've tried so hard. I felt like Stephen Fry won best gay at the end of the night. He did that speech and everyone. Yeah. That, it, <laughs> yeah. But I was glad to to see someone else there who was a bit confused by the whole event. Yes. I looked around. I always look for the most awkward person in the room and I, I, I find solace in the fact it's not always me. Yeah. I was sat at a table with like Ellie Goulding and everyone kept coming up for selfies with her and I was just sat staring vacantly like <laughs> what, what am I meant I meant I guess I'm meant to be charming in some way but I had no social skills that night um <laughs> but I sort of I gravitate towards the people that aren't the the ones getting the selfies that have the perfect whatever the per- the perfect insta life yeah <laughs> uh being slightly marginal dwell- dwelling creature myself are you yeah I oh, never know what to yeah. wear to those things too no I panic yeah but you're young, so I assume that that might be easier, but maybe not. Clothes are, are hard for me. I, I think I have my casual look down, but um, formal things. I, like, I'll say no to a, going to a wedding because I'm too stressed about what to wear. I do the same. Yeah. I panic about it. Yeah. Because also clothes, I don't know, I, I sort of, I, 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 I hope, well, at least in my head, I resist definition. But as soon as I put on smart clothes, I feel that other people are defining me. Totally. That's so true, yeah. And it's a narrower... You have a na- narrower options with formal clothes. I might. So what have, do you go for? Well, I was thinking of having something tailored, like a a nice. Cause, uh, yeah. I guess I, I like kind of men's clothes, but then I don't want to be in a full suit or a tux. I don't know. So I thought I might design something. I just thought, perfect. Yeah. You know what? Uh, yeah. Have you ever seen Baz Luhrmann's Romeo and Juliet? I have. So you know, there's a scene at a costume party, and he's wearing. Leo's wearing a knight costume. Yeah. I always wanted that. So Do I it. I thought I could just wear like a chain mail kind of thing. And then I looked into it and it's all, tons of queer women are looking for this costume. Looking for chain mail. Looking for this specific Leonardo DiCaprio look. Did that depress you or excite you? That it, you're, you have, <laughs> you have company or you're sad because you wanted to be the outlier? I found it reassuring. Um, okay. And there's one German woman in Berlin who's making them, and, but they cost like eight grand or something. So I, I have to think about it. My friend Andy Crid used to make chain mail and he was, he was on his own. He was at a time when nobody was looking for it. Yeah. <laughs> and he just went to college and he said, I want to make this stuff. And he would just sit there fashioning endless night's outfits. That's amazing. I like that's a dying skill, right? It is. I, I like the idea of like an old blacksmith hammer and uh, sparks flying. And well, maybe next time both of us fail to win best gay, yeah, we could be wearing <laughs> chainmail and everyone will be so yeah. I don't. I guess at that I was an, I was, you know, I, I I always think that just to be in the room, everyone's done pretty well. Yeah, <laughs> kind of, totally, you know, totally. Everyone's had their own. Um, their own battles yeah it feels a little strange giving a trophy to one of them at the end yeah yeah it is a strange thing and then it's sponsored by all these companies who have questionable um practices as well yeah but you know it was nice to be there (laughs) nice to sit at a table with ellie golding that was cool yeah she's a good egg apparently i've never met her but she um, seems good she seems like she's trying hard yes. to be good in the world you know that's all you can be you yeah. can't succeed at anything god only knows no there's not enough power it, one doesn't have i mean one's own agency is so limited but i do try i've sort of i've got into an argument last night we we, sh- we should point out that we're recording this in the center of of london town in the midst of the extinction rebellion uh, yeah. kickoff uh the beautiful kickoff and i i had a row with a cab driver who just was so against it mm. and i just thought but they're trying yeah. It might be affecting your business and I can see how that's frustrating. Yeah. But they're trying to do something, they're trying to raise awareness, they're trying to and and you can drill down on oh yes, but you know, they'll get carted away in you know diesel fueled police cars. Yeah. They take flights, they might have kids, they eat at McDonald's. But they're trying to they're trying to break out of complacency. Yeah. And um I think that level of panic that and and that anger that people are responding with is so telling it's just because they have no counter argument and they're they're threatened and they're they don't want to change the way they live so um yeah and i heard not to bring up louis ck but i heard that (laughs) that, uh, he he did someone put some set of his online recently like recorded some warm-up gig of his and he was saying i think um 
oh, when I was a teenager, we did acid and, and we're rebelling in these ways. And these kids are so annoying and righteous and they're all they talk about is gender and the environment. And it's like, that is so much more revolutionary than just doing acid. <laughs> like, exactly, which benefits no one. I mean, you go on your own yeah. very insular journey on yeah. acid. You're not kind of saving, trying to save the world. I mean, no one raises awareness when they're high. Yeah, totally. So I, I'm really all for it. I think, yeah, no, I think me too. Good. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I sort of feel it's such a harumphy kind of old curmudgeon's position to take against youth. You know, just to, as you say, just as a, because there is no counter argument. It's just a knee jerk thing of oh, children mm. these days. Children these days are smarter and more switched on yeah. and more careful. Yeah. Than I ever was. Absolutely, and it seems to come naturally to them, and compassion seems to come more naturally, and things like bullying are, are uncool now. <laughs> it used to be cool. Did you get were you bullied? Not really. I. I didn't really hang out with people my own age because I started doing comedy when I was about 13 so and then dropped out of school so I didn't really give anyone a chance to to bully me and I also was saying on stage all the worst things that about myself that anyone could say do you know what I mean yeah so I kind of said them which first. seems to be a particular sort of female trope I think yeah because you get to yourself before anyone has the chance and at the time like a as a, you know I always looked pretty queer so I think that's that still happens a lot as a queer comp. You go on stage and you have to say it first because everyone's thinking it. So I think that I see a lot of maybe that's changing a bit. But do you do you have to say it now? Do you think I don't anymore? But I definitely in the beginning had to immediately say I know I look like this and it, I know it's <laughs> I know everyone's noticed it because otherwise there's a tension in the room. Like does she know she looks like that? <laughs> like <laughs> what though? It's yeah, like... I know. Yeah, yeah, I know. It's it's all changing for sure. But it's yeah. interesting that somebody like you, who I certainly don't associate with uh, feeling queasy about identity, mm. would would feel that you have to come on and the first thing you have to do is make an, essentially an apology. Yeah. Or, as you say, diffuse tension that's been created by other people's kind of potential prejudice. Yeah. I think it's taken a, a while to get there, though, because it's uh, 20 years now doing stand-up. So why, so why stand up at 13? I, mean, I don't that's know. crazy. What a mistake. I, I don't no, not know. a mistake. Well... I don't know it's all I ever wanted to do and then and I I started taking an improv class and then um and then loved it yeah did you did you ever do stand-up I know you were in Footlights yeah I did a bit it's not my uh I like improv yeah I love improv so I'd be happy just going uh I don't know to the De Montford in Leicester or going to wherever and just doing two hours of improv mm. and that for me is my safe space so I would go on stage and there'd be no adrenaline spike yeah really none and that's with people or on your own just on my own, but wow. happily with people also. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, because the, the audience would be my people, do you know what I mean? And yeah. we'd just go through stuff. And, oh my God, heaven. Because that's you're just being yourself as well. That's the thing. For me, the the reason I do anything is to try and, this sounds counterintuitive, but to find authenticity. Yeah. Well, you wouldn't just have to find it, you should just generate it. But I, I'm always looking for a feeling that, feel, that, that, that resonates as authentic and when you write jokes, and I've never been a really good joke writer, by the time I'd get to say them on stage, I was bored and they felt they were othered. Mm. They felt they were coming from a different place or a different voice. Yeah. So no, I mean, to answer your question, no, I've never redone it. When I have done it, I've been not great at it. Yeah. Because I've... I don't really like jokes because people don't speak in jokes. Yeah, true, true. And and so and my favourite comedians do a lot of crowd work and are very much themselves and... Um, I've started doing improvised stand up now and I'm really yeah, enjoying that. So yeah, so I how does that work for you? Mean. How do you how do you kick that night off? Yeah, because you'd be able to get the, the audience kind of in a good space to be able to play with you. Yeah, they write down questions as they come in and then put them in a bucket and then um it's so nice. They're they're so um forgiving when they know like <laughs> and we just chat and uh and then I answer the questions and I do weird plays and but it's it's kind of um reinvigorated like it's reminded me why I wanted to start performing in the first place because you you have to kind of rely more on I don't know I forget I guess at some point someone said I was funny when I was 13 but I kind of forget who that person was or why I was funny or what you know what I mean mm. and so it reminds you of that because you have to rely on just personality and being but silly. I mean, but people can be told they're funny at 13. It takes a particular type of person to then go and book a gig. Yeah. So you're, a, I'm not one of these <laughs> people, but you're a person that sort of actualizes. Yeah. You know, you make real what you want to do. 
Yeah. I sort of blunder around and eventually a stage door opens and I find myself in a theatre and I just chat for a couple of hours and then leave. Really? I don't believe that. Well, I, mean, I don't know. A mate of mine said something which I, which felt true. It said, you just back into the limelight. Which <laughs> I really... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, <laughs> I'm just sort of always going, oh, this is awful. Hello. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I can't... I'm addicted to it, but um, I find it very... At the same time, I'm extremely awkward about it. Yeah. Well, I've definitely never been... Sometimes I read biographies of comedians who are like I just have to get on stage every night and they're out gigging I've never had that I've, no. if a gig is cancelled I'm thrilled I'd mm. love to stay home <laughs> I have to be at home with my dog and that's my main thing and I will work out how many nights a week I can achieve that goal. yeah what um, kind of dog well this the Staffy. Uh, oh, I managed to put this through a wash with multiple tissues so I've come out looking I don't know like I've been in the middle of a Tissue nado. What does um, it say? That's it's more staffies. More, more staffies. Oh my god! A yeah, filthy little uh, ex drug dog. They're beautiful. What do you mean ex drug? Well, like, she was an ex drug dealer's dog. Oh wow! So in the park, when kids are smoking weed, she'll go and sit next to them and look really? lovingly. Oh yeah. wow! And they'll freak out. Yeah, yeah. So they're she, such kind dog staffies. They and, are. Yeah, I like big. I like big dogs. You can kind of thump and hug and. I don't she's, like little yappy ones. She's filth. I mean, she's just got teats down <laughs> to the ground. She's had about a billion puppies. Oh. She's she's a kind. She's taught me so much about kindness and patience. Mm. I'm not a very patient person. I have sort of ADHD, so I'm constantly sort of rolling onto the next thing. And mm. just sitting with a dog, suddenly twenty minutes can go by and you haven't gone on to the next thing. Yeah, I've just been in this sort of meditative state. I absolutely love it. But for me, she's yeah, lying I'm, on your lap, farting, and you can't oh, move her. Yeah. She needs to be held like a baby. Yeah. Oh God, I love she it. She has abandonment issues. Oh, stop! This is. I need a dog. I think you do. Yeah. But how would that work in your life? It wouldn't. It wouldn't. But one day it will. Yeah, you must. And as soon as it will, I'm getting one. It's life changing. Yeah. You, you, you have to do it. I want a big, dumb, fat dog that just waits for me. When I and is so excited to see me, yeah, that's what I want. Yeah, that's had a terrible life, and you yeah. saved it so that even in the darkest of hours, you can feel good every time you open the door. But yeah, it's so narcissistic, this god complex. But um, yeah, no, it's all narcissistic. <laughs> I've saved you, and I want reminding yeah. every night. Yeah, my neighbors. I live in a building, and um, I've never known my neighbors, but I got to know my neighbors, and they have a greyhound rescue greyhound that was living in a concrete box its whole life and it's it's really docile and sleepy i thought they have to be always running but um 20 minutes a day and then they're done yeah so i've been looking after that sometimes if they go out he, um arthur comes over and he's like that's good for you just heartbreaking i just touch his nose how many gigs do you do a week then if you're saying that these, is it compulsive for you to be a comic um these days not not many so i've been filming stuff more and so i'm doing once a week now i'm doing an hour work in progress of new stuff um but that's I, I sometimes go weeks and then and then I'll have a burst where I do like four or five. But it's mostly if friends ask me at these days. I, I don't yeah, know. The it, benefit, the the Yeah. Value, yeah. But now I'm sort of building towards a new show, so I think I'll have to gig more. But um And does that fill you with is it a stressful thing to start a new project? Yeah, because I've really been enjoying improvising. So the idea of writing a new hour is a bit daunting. Um and mm. you have to think well, what do I want to say and where am I in my life and yeah because like you say I want it to be authentic and reflecting where I am now and that changes all the time all the time every day so you know and so that's why I find it very hard to commit things to paper that that are personal yeah because like I remember the, mo the most the most inauthentic experience I ever had was was coming out publicly mm. um because I was sleeping with a cameraman at the time. Oh, wow. But it became clear that I kind of had to do this ludicrous, outmoded, sort of rite of passage declaration. Yeah. Because everyone was swirling and going, we think she's one of those. Yeah. So I thought, well, I, my parents had been told, you know, years before and yeah. couldn't give them monkeys. But it just felt like I have to do this because it's, it is, on one level, extremely important. Mm. But on a level, it's... It's really wrong. It's a really wrong time. Totally. And also, did you feel, well, like, if, yeah, you're sleeping with the cameraman, it, then coming out kind of bulldozes over the nuances of your own life. Yeah, and I felt bad for him. I mean, we were, I won't, I, you know, we're mates, and, and I, I think he would laugh along with me when I say, you know, it wasn't, it turned, it was, we were not the loves of each other's lives. Yeah. <laughs> that was not what was going on there. But, um, did you think about, 
coming out as bi or, or it didn't it didn't really there wasn't a thing yeah it wasn't a thing yeah so this is what interests me I mean obviously I know you you, you, you wrote the book which is can everyone please calm down this is a long title can everyone please calm down a oh, yeah, I know. guide to 21st century sexuality yeah it's a long title Oh, I don't know. But it's a lovely <laughs> thing to, to see how it has changed and how... My, my thing was always, stop making me say who I am because by the time it's out there, I may have changed my mind. Yeah, totally. And you have the right to change your mind. Yeah. In yeah. each rolling second. And then even by the time that book was published, it was outdated. You know, it's changing so fast. So um, that was an interesting How many initials too. now does the LGBTQI... IA plus. I think that's it. QIAA maybe. Okay. But I just say LGBT plus, which is the same number as letters as RSPCA, isn't it? Yeah. It's sort of mem- you know. Different outreach team, but yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. For anyone wishing to call the helpline, be ca- do get the. It's there is a difference. Yeah. Um, it's a tricky thing with with labels because, um, I get their importance too, and that. And yeah. visibility is so important. And if you're struggling, that can be so useful to have the, the language to find a community and all that. But in my own life, I found them. I found them kind of anno- annoying. Yeah, yeah, because it's always someone else grilling you about it. And and yeah, as you say, it can change all the time. And it's but it's interesting. You've become the spokesperson for. You've been labelled as the spokesperson for not having labels. Yeah, I mean, it's like you know, you're the go-to right. person now. Yeah, which must be kind of annoying. <laughs> Oh, I, I just have to keep learning like I, that book was aimed at teenagers and then it was interesting promoting it and really feeling the generational divide like I, I went and spoke to a bunch of teenagers and um, and they were just amazing and they were all like yeah this is common sense and mm. all these these jocks standing up like sporty boys and saying I, I think I'm straight at the moment but how, how can I be a better ally for my trans friend I was like this is insane this is so different to yeah. my experience and then that night I did a, the same talk but for a Radio 4 audience and they were furious and they, the Q&A was so different of people they were furious yeah a lot of people stressed about about trans people and I was so it's just such an interesting yeah I think uh I think this next generation's they're on it. I think they're on it. I look at my niece who's sixteen and she's she's all over it. Really? Yeah, yeah. she's all over it. And yeah. some of the I I've 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 got a lot in a weird way, subconsciously I think a lot of my validation has come from from kids like her. Yeah. Know, just just you know, when she was six or seven, just excitedly running down the stairs to the spare room where I was sleeping with my partner and just getting into bed with us and going to sleep. Yeah. Was just with more validation than anybody else could give us a wordless validation that's so nice that everything is just the same yeah that's there's, beautiful there's there's no need for anyone else to get anxious or for their hearts to beat fast over what I choose to yeah. do in the privacy of my own home the thing I take from that that long title book is just calm down and you're right yeah. it's just when did everybody get so anxious about something so irrelevant to their own life yeah and um, it's so politicised now and so I want. I I worry that it's taking the fun out of what's we're talking about. Basically, love and and sex, right? Yeah. The the most universal and best things in the world. So, I, yeah. I hope you got to have a sense of humor about it too. But I liked what I read something that you said about that being gay is like the forty seventh most interesting thing about you. And I always felt that too. And and um, my parents were really good like that. So, I think that's important too. Yeah, I remember saying. I mean, I said that probably quite a while ago now, and it was just at the stage where I would I would do um, you know a, a bit of press about something, and then and it would come back, and it would just have my name, my age, and the word gay. Yeah, and like a permanent prefix to your name. Yeah, yeah like those were my top trumps, and like, <laughs> does anyone else want to play? What are you? How old are you? You yeah. know, Christ, yeah, she's yeah. old. Um, <laughs> so, uh, and that has changed. Actually. Yeah. Now I never see it, and that's either because I've been, you know, in around so long that nobody cares, yeah. or, or genuinely attitudes have changed, and there isn't that need to define and delineate. And I think it is changing. Yeah, I think so. I, I hope so. This episode of the podcast is sponsored by HelloFresh. HelloFresh is the UK's leading recipe box service, delivering fresh, pre-portioned ingredients and step-by-step recipes to your door. 
It's the easy, convenient way to cook delicious dinners from scratch. Perfect for anyone who doesn't have time to prepare their own meals or just isn't very good at cooking. You get to choose your favourites from 19 recipes every week, including rapid recipes which will be ready in 20 minutes or less. They offer family favourites like cheeseburger and wedges, as well as world cuisine and even lower calorie balanced recipes. In my first box, I got a delicious beetroot, green bean and orange salad, which is from the balance range. It was super fast and easy to put together, and there were no wasted ingredients. It's flexible, so you can change the size of your delivery, as well as when and where you want it delivered. To sign up for your first box, head to hellofresh.co.uk. Choose a box, a delivery slot, and add your favourite recipes. All their fresh ingredients come direct from suppliers, pre-portioned, so there's no food waste. There's also a great selection of veggie options. HelloFresh are offering our listeners £60 off four boxes. Visit www.hellofresh.co.uk and enter the code OUR at the checkout to enjoy delicious dinners without the drama. You've just filmed your Netflix show. Have you, yeah. Is it in the can? It's in the can. So it's tell all me about done. it. Yeah, I'm really nervous. I've never acted before. Like, I, it was so... I was in way over my head, but um, I had no. the best time. So I think it comes out in February or March. So what's the what's the premise? Well, um, it's about... Uh, I play a version of myself, so a comedian called May, who's... Uh, <laughs> you say a version of yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Do you mean a photocopy? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Um, who's a recovering addict and uh, gets into a relationship with a previously straight woman. Um, and it's just a romantic comedy about addiction and and love. And, yeah, it's quite... It gets gets dark in places but i think it's i think it's funny it's got lisa kudrow playing my mom that was insane that's pretty cool i know i'm i'm a huge huge fan of the comeback this show that she did that was mostly it seems improvised I, maybe it was scripted but it's just an amazing show mm. called the comeback that she did after friends and obviously i love friends but so yeah it was amazing so what did you learn from the actors around you what was the big tip well i just kind of thought I mean, you've acted. I thought... Oh, it's a, that's, a, that's a loose term. Uh, <laughs> that's a loose term. I kind of thought um, you just arrange your... F- I was like, how do I... So I'm doing a scene where I'm very sad. <laughs> so how do I arrange my face to look sad? <laughs> and uh, what facial expressions... I was obsessed with facial expressions. And then everyone was like, no, no, just feel sad and your face will do it. So that was I. So you started. This is amazing. So you yeah. started with just the muscular yeah. contortion of the face. Yeah, that's how I, you act. Yeah, totally. Because I was like, this is brand new. <laughs> well, definitely in my. I, I, it's not like a. I don't know, but then I found it. Um, I ended up finding it. I, I, all my friends are actors, and so I was pretty. I was judgmental when they were like, "Oh, I'm so drained from doing this play. I'm just emotionally exhausted." And I was like, "Wow, oh, really? From pretending to be sad for an mm-hmm. hour, and now you're tired." But actually, it was very intense. The hours are long. <laughs> long hours, and um, my character relapses in it, so I had to do a lot of like snorting fake coke and stuff, which I found really difficult and mm. um, intense. So that that was yeah, intense. But it is funny. I promise. It sounds really bleak, but no. I mean, I, I but I also think all great comedy has to have a counterpoint. Otherwise, it's yeah. relentless and. Yeah, and sinister almost. It's yeah, like, what, are you, what are you selling here? This is nothing like real life. Yeah, it's eerie. Um, that is a big deal though for a, a recovering addict to mm. recreate. Yeah, I didn't really think that through when I wrote it. I, That's horrible. Yeah, I guess I, I. It's been so long, and and um, but I think for for most people who've had specifically a coke problem, or I don't know any drug maybe, but you you imagine all the time what it would be like to relapse and what that would look like and how you'd feel and um so in a way it was cathartic to do that to and it felt awful (laughs) so that was yeah that's good great well don't do that uh but yeah very strange so how long uh have you been clean how long have you stayed clear i give or take i'd say (laughs) about 10 years (laughs) yeah i was mostly it was my my teens were very explosive and then um and then mellowed out and it was yeah. coke. Coke was your poison. Yeah, 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 yeah. I've never done coke. Good. It's horrible and horrible for the world. Like it's ruining communities in South America. That's yeah, but so are avocados. Yeah, that's so, true. They're hard as a mainline. But I just learned that. Yeah. So should we not be eating them? 
I'll let you know in a month. I'm off to Mexico to deal with some cartel, genuinely. Yeah, who, really? Yeah, who, who control the whole of the... What, avocado. for a documentary or something? Yeah. Oh, wow, that's so interesting. Yeah, so uh, I, will, I will find out. But yeah, no, it's never been... Uh, anything that would get me more anxious? No, thanks. Yeah. It no. must have been around a lot. Did you see it a lot? A lot. A lot, actually. In TV um, and... Yeah. and uh, yeah, well, you you know what it's like. You'd go into those those rooms before gigs, and mm. it, I always used to think, God, it's made it's made your face change. Mm-hmm. Something goes across the face like a shadow, like a cloud. Yeah, like a possession, actually. There's tension in the mouth, and yeah, it's a kind of darkness. And I just thought, no, I don't want that. But I was, I was always my my addiction was always booze. Right. Yeah. yeah. Booze and weed and, and so I would feel calm but also like I could just be anywhere and do anything yeah so superhuman so luckily no I, I because I'd be yeah. dead by now because I have a hugely addictive personality yeah I would be dead yeah for me it was stimulant so just I f- focus I mean I was also an insecure teenager and then here were all these confident adults with and it made me feel confident and focused and uh so I think that's what it was. But they, I've been reading this guy, Gabor Mate. He's this really good um, addiction specialist. And he always talks about not thinking about why the addiction, cause, but, but what, what's missing, why the pain that is causing you yeah. to want to change the present moment so drastically so that's an interesting thing you think, you what am I la- what does this give me what am I lacking but you had by your own admission you had really sort of really cool parents who were very open hearted and liberal and accepting mm. so where's the hole where's the gap I don't know um, well I don't know I mean they were yeah they were they were great and I don't know I felt I wanted to get out of my own body I, I, I just yeah. I always felt yeah, anxious and insecure all through my childhood. I think I don't know, and who knows why? I mean, it should, it just gives you a, a yeah. You're right. You just you just jettison out of your yeah preoccupations into a sort of what you perceive to be a bigger, brave new world. Don't you yeah, realize? yeah, exactly. And then so quickly it it spirals. I, but I still of, have that impulse that you know. So where does it redirect? Because I'm always yeah. interested in, in because as you say, absolutely. The addiction is not the thing. The addiction is the manifestation. Yes. It's the, it's the underneath bit. It's the, it's the inciting incident if you were writing a screenplay. Yeah. It? It's, the, it's the cold open. Yeah. What, um, <laughs> what, what is to hunt that down as a thing? Because if you don't, then it just you just will find other things to be addicted to. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I guess I'm a bit of a workaholic now. And um, yeah, what, what's the root cause? I don't know. I'll get back to you. I'm, I'm. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm just. I mean, I, I kind of. I, I suppose that's that's always been my trajectory is to find out. Mm. Uh, mine's always love and relationships. And yeah, same. Yeah. Oh, do you, would you? Yeah, that fills the void for you. My 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 mate who also said I back into the limelight, so she is very perceptive. Yeah, you've uh, got to pay this person for their time. She's incredible. God, I love her. Um. She said to me, "The thing is, perks. I've mostly perks. The thing is, perks is when you, when you're the monkey swinging on the vine and you're grabbing at the next one. You, you've only ever got one hand on each. Oh, so you spend great. your life just with one hand on something. You're just half in everything. Wow, that's great. Just try being a hundred percent in something. It's like, yeah. Oh God. Wow. Yeah, that sounds good, but I don't want to do that. That's amazing. Because the one hand is always that, the, 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 the one is affixed, but the other one is just grasping for something else. Yeah. And it's whether it's grasping for, you know, uh, I don't know, uh, a better gig. Yeah, or a more intense relationship. A more intense, or, exactly. Yeah. Drama. God, I mean, thankfully. Same. <laughs> yeah. Age is incredible. When you get old, um, that you can't physically do the drama, and that's what's great, <laughs> mm. <laughs> because the tendency is to still try and do it. Yeah, but it's just your just body's going no, not this again. Yeah, I can't do this escalation of insanity. Absolutely, but I still want. I always want to, and and it's finding out the why is, yeah, yeah. But it's interesting how humans will 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 often default to what once the the stimulants or the downers or the boo whatever it is. Once you combat that, then love is the next thing. The tendrils go out. Yeah. And it's like, love me, accept me, you know. But I, I sort of think being in love, you present your best version of yourself. So the first bit. The first bit's the best. You're doing this amazing performance all the time. where, And you see yourself through someone else's eyes as this yeah. magical person. And 
and uh and vice versa and yeah and then when all the all your the the depths of yourself are being brought out and then there's things to dislike you're like oh no wait what about yeah. those early stages <laughs> yeah i like that first bit yeah and the hands going out so. yeah <laughs> yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah i mean i i'm yeah i've i'm sort of serial monogamous so i don't i don't play about but i there's always like a rizzler paper between each yeah each singular experience yeah i have been a serial monogamous and very intense true mm. and then now i've been single for a couple of years and uh in trying to enjoy that and not obsess over that part of my life and let it dominate the rest so how does as someone who's addicted to, to love and relationships how does that work how do you how do you stop the oxytocin from dominating yeah i'm doing well i haven't i mean i haven't yeah. I think I've been so busy with work and I really cared about that that Netflix show that I just made. I, I, so the past four years, I've been really obsessed so just with all, it. all that. Yeah, and I was filming a, in Manchester and running around and so that has helped. And then now there's this strange quiet after, now that it's in the can, I'm like, yeah. Um, so what will you do? What will fill the void? I think work still. And then, I, you know, I'm trying to, I'm, I'm out there, I'm dating. I'm, I've been on the dating apps now though and... and so is that I, dismal or okay it's pretty grim yeah it's just so unlikely that you're going to meet someone who you who you have lots in common with and but doesn't everybody know who you are and that has its own baggage doesn't it yeah someone screenshotted our chats and posted them That's so nice i have to be really careful i think yeah so so yeah but how else are you gonna go on lots of dates listen you just have to work less yeah <laughs> That's the thing. When all this, you know, the Netflix thing's out and there's a big hurrah about it and everybody loves it, then you can just go, phew, okay, I'm going to write a second series. But while I'm doing that, I'm going to play and I'm going to have fun and I'm going to be yeah. in, in real world scenarios. Yeah, I just went to Canada for a couple of weeks and that was really nice. Saw my old pals, uh, walked around and didn't do any work and didn't think about work at all. So that was good. I went to Medieval Times where people joust and you watch no. it. Yeah, and you eat with your hands. And, You're obsessed um, with chain mail. That's what it is. You just, chain you just want <laughs> yeah. to be a knight. I did buy a sword there. Um, what do you mean? You don't don't chuck that in like... I bought a plastic. It's too casual. Yeah. <laughs> you bought a sword. Yeah. But it was, it's just a, a plastic <laughs> sword, but um, I was waving it around and... Um, so that was really fun. Have you ever seen those things, Medieval Times? And they actually yeah, properly joust. Yeah, it's full on. Yeah. And I said to the one of the staff members, um, I was like, just the horses are fine, right? Just tell me that the horses yeah. are enjoying it. And she was like, they love it. I said, yeah, they always right. say that. Sure, 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 sure. That's not what they say about the gorilla that's furiously yeah. wanking itself to death in the zoo. Yeah. Oh, he loves it. He it loves, loves it. It's yeah. his favorite thing, just to be incarcerated <laughs> for the rest of his life. Yeah. Um, but what, so apart from the fact that you love chain mail, why... why why that? Why 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 do you like I sort do, of formal I, entertainment? Yeah, well in terms of like, you know, staying away from damaging things like stimulants and, and stuff, I do fill my time with like organized fun activities, like a lot of escape rooms or um I've never done one. Oh you have to. It's so fun. What's the best one? Can you um, say? Are we allowed to say Dan? Yeah. We can say. There's one called Clue Quest that's pretty good. In Where is it? In town. King's Cross. Oh my god, I've got to do it. So you go in and you're locked in a room and you have an hour to escape and it it's just a room like this and you, you think, well, there's no way I'm getting out of here. And then you start looking behind chairs and there's little clues and there's oh locks and keys. How many yeah, do you we do, should do one. Um, You can do up to f six people or so, but oh I think you want to go four people. Have you, Dan, have you? No. You've got to do no, it. No, no, no. I really want to do that. Yeah. The thing I really want to do is, because my my addiction in a way, well, I have lots of them, but, but uh, challenging myself. Mm. So doing things that I'm totally terrified of doing and accepting every dare. Yeah. Like once my then partner, we were in Mallorca on a cliff and she said, jump, I dare you. And I did. And I atomized my coccyx. Oh my Imagine God. Imagine bones in a bag just being smashed to dust and then getting oh. out. Yeah, my ass bone was just pulverized because I didn't hit the water straight. It was like, it was like 25 meter drop. Oh. And I just thought, well, I can't see rocks. Fuck it, I'm gonna just go for it. And you landed just on badly. Yeah. Oh my and god. It was excruciating, searing. And then, really I, could you still swim after? Like, were you no, I sort of doggy paddled up, yeah. and then the locals were sort of half laughing and half calling an ambulance. Uh -huh. And then I had to sit on one of those weird, like, pile cushions, like a donut, because yeah. my tailbone was just screwed. Oh, I can feel it now. Yeah, like, it's my bad. tailbone's hurting. Yeah. And, and when it's cold, it really is. Still. It's, yeah, I wince a bit. Wow. 
So I sort of permanently have to... That's a adrenaline junkie stuff. Like, yeah, yeah. But also it'll, whether it's gigging, or like the improv thing also. Yeah. Even though I don't feel the adrenaline, I think it's that it's still part of that challenging sort of thing. Yeah. Are there any untapped social experiences you really fancy doing? I'm not into skydiving or heights or anything like that. No, no thanks. Unless somebody dares me, in which case I will have to do it. Really? So yeah. are you competitive? Is that part no, of it? Compl- oh, okay. No, it's just, it, it, it's, 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 I don't know what it is. Anything I'm dared to do, I just do it. Yeah. And it's not good. Right. Bad <laughs> things have happened. Really bad things have happened. I wonder if I'd get into like live action role playing. You know, people do that. That's sort of medieval and they dress up and, and it's, it's improv basically. And like battle reenactment? No, like, um... It's, I think it's like someone's a knight, someone's a wench. She always goes back. It's the it's same thing. Same it's night. just, <laughs> this, this, is what, nice. this is what the addiction stems from. <laughs> yeah. Is you grew up and you realised you were not a knight. You were yeah. not of the knightly class. You were never going to wear the chain mail and everything stemmed from this. Do you think in a, maybe in a past life I was a knight or something? There and are I'm people just... online who will do that shit for you. Yeah. I, anything you want is online, isn't it? Oh, God, yeah. You can pay to have people kidnap you and just what? have that experience. They bung you in a in a van and drive you away. What what, <laughs> what were you doing the night that you found that on Google? <laughs> I've been really going mad on Google. And, and the other day I was I thought I should audit a course. Like, I should learn something new, maybe a history course. And I went online. I'm telling you, I know it's going to be medieval period. It's going to be, yeah, yeah, 12th century. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but then I was Googling and I found... Uh, this magician called Justin who'll come to your house and teach you tricks and, and I hired him he came over on Saturday what? yeah it was only 60 quid and he came for two hours was it just the two of you? no I had a couple of friends there okay and he um, taught us about nine tricks it was about the skill level of like a 13 year old at a, bu- yeah, at a bar yeah, mitzvah that, yeah, yeah. yeah but it was amazing so I'm just filling my time in various ways but you should get Justin round. You should. I want Justin round. Yeah, card tricks, a uh, thing with a coin. A thing with a coin? Yeah. You, I'm telling you now, you have a way to go. Yeah. <laughs> before you could wear that dazzling jeweled waistcoat and go from table to table to groups of disinterested people at events. Yeah, do you guys want to see a thing with a coin? Yeah, <laughs> yeah May does. She does the card thing. She does the coin <laughs> thing. I think that's it. Yeah. I think I'm just trying to Im- improve my stock so that I get a good spouse, you know? I think if I know about nine magic tricks, then... And if I'm at a dinner party, I'll get a better spouse. That interests me because for me, magicians aren't always sexual catnip. (laughs) That's all I'm going to say. And if there are any magicians listening, then no disrespect to your illustrious profession. Yeah. But I don't always associate that profession with high octane sexual attraction. But you're right. I mean, I'm a huge fan of self, you know, improvement. Yeah. And the idea that you're right, you know, you, you have to constantly, you know, think, how can I be better? I'm learning Spanish. Are you? And then is it? I just want to speak Spanish in someone's ear. I don't even know whose ear. See, isn't that just interesting though? Because it's not really about yourself. It's about yeah. other people. Trying to impress. Tr- That's I how always I say that what we do is basically we're trying to. We're, it's a cult of us, and we're just trying to recruit. Yeah. So every night you go out there, and you're just hoping that through the miasma of shit that you're farting out, yeah. that, that <laughs> someone will sign up. Yeah, hundred percent. That's tragic, isn't it? And then if it goes wrong, it's just a self-esteem firing squad because you're like, well, they don't like me as a person. But I guess that that's that's the starting point anyway. Yeah. So you're just back to square one. I yeah. mean, for me, it's just it it affirms some some long-held beliefs. Totally. I, I guess. Yes. But you're right. No, the Spanish I, is just. It's to whisper in someone's ear. Yeah. I did a, a two-year diploma program in shiatsu massage therapy when I was 20. I got my diploma. It cost six grand. It took two years of my life, Monday to Friday, nine to five. I've never done it since. And that was purely... To be an amazing master. To be an amazing partner to someone. I thought, this is going to... This, this is extraordinary. We've, yeah. we've really mined in now to something. <laughs> so for two years and six grand... Yeah. I it's got, not even about the art of shiatsu. It's not even about no. the deep interest in the pressure points that may relieve Couldn't care tension. less. It's just, I'm going to be <laughs> someone's most mind-blowing partner. Yeah, I was going to... Don Juan de Marca, this is going to be, like, magic for... Yeah, for someone. Did it work? Um, yeah, I got... I Yeah, I, I, I was engaged. I had a five-year relation with someone and I think that was a big part of it was the uh, the massage element. How old were you when you were engaged? 25. Yeah, I was 20 to 25 with with someone amazing and then um and then ended it. You ended it. Yeah, I ended it. But it was a very wonderful relationship. Do you regret it? 
Ending it. Ending it. No, no, we're still friends and she's now engaged to someone else. And I just, when I was in Canada, went to her family cottage with her and her new fiance. Very mature. Very mature. I was freaking out. I'm good mate. So I was engaged at 21. Were you? Yeah. And did you propose? No, because he proposed. Wow. This was a guy. And, and what happened was, so we were engaged for a bit. And then about two years later, we both realized we were both gay. And <laughs> he now lives with a beautiful French man in France. And I love him. And you're still friends. I love him. That's so I always nice. loved him. Yeah. yeah Which yeah. again is, is a mystery for people who see these things as sort of binary and non, yeah. you know, uh, nuanced. Yeah. And then I think I've been engaged a couple of times since, yeah. but I'm not really sure. It's so great to get engaged. It's so fun. Fab. Yeah. It's, it's the best. always the bit before the relationship ends. Right? Yes. It's either break up or get engaged. <laughs> well, it's, it's either break up or get engaged and then break up. Yeah. For me. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. I, I now see it as the death knell. <laughs> yeah. I think I agree. But what a high on the day. Oh, it's wonderful. I've, yeah. I've nearly been engaged in Venice and Rome yeah. and all, all around the world. And it, and it, it, you're right. There's that there's that incredible feeling of God. I love you, and this this is over now, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> because we've reached a peak experience. Yeah, from which we can only climb down from. God, and, that's so true. Do you think that as time goes on and relationships evolve and stuff, that marriage will be less and less common? Well. I think there's always a drive for people to lock it down, lock something down. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, not me actually, but but a lot of people, mm. and, and you know, fair play. The estate of marriage, yeah. I mean, I think that will die out because I mean, I was delighted that civil partnership came in for for heterosexual couples. Mm. I think it's really important for people who don't want to, you know, have their union enshrined in that patriarchal kind of system. Yeah, it's it's. It's great. So I think still people will want to be conjoined in some official way. They'll some people really love that thing of getting all the family and the mates around and viewing the spectacle. Yeah. Um, but I, I think, think that the um, sort of yeah the, the 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 godly kind of tax breaks we yeah. got you by the bollocks stuff will go maybe. And then people talk about how monogamy is dying and everyone's going to be polyamorous, but I actually don't think that's true. I think. I can't do. I, I'd love to be able to. Yeah, I don't think I can. But the the thing, the the oxytocin thing, just does. Is it oxytocin? Yeah, yeah. It just does for me because it's another drug. You know, mm. it's another. It's like I am locked in now. Mm. You know, I can't. I can't. I've never been able to do that thing where I can just be surface. Yeah, and I'm very envious of people who can. I've I've just been doing it for the last year and a half or so, and and. Uh, it's been a great relief, but I feel very ready for the oxytocin again. What's the trick to not letting the oxytocin rule everything? I'm just, um, I mean, maybe I just haven't met the right, <laughs> that's maybe. possible. But also just being so busy and, and also I'm, I have, I'm afraid of emotional mess right now and pain. I, it's so painful when it's relationships awful. end. It's the worst and it just completely turns you upside down and I, I'm not up for that right now. I got too much to do. Yeah. So I, and I don't want to hurt anyone else or get hurt. So I don't mind being hurt. Really? I don't like it. I, I, yeah. I'm not inviting it, by the way, from the universe or yeah. from anybody in my near vicinity. Yeah. I know you mean that it's cleaner to get hurt than to hurt yeah. someone. Yeah. It's like okay, this is awful. But it, but there does there isn't that doubt of maybe I've made a mistake and because yeah. if you hurt someone, then you think, oh God, I could just make this better tomorrow by fixing it and yeah and have I done the right thing and yeah and in a way being rejected sort of plays into the to the old belief of well quite right mm -hmm. that's absolutely correct yeah you finally have seen the truth which is I am shit yeah Goodbye. <laughs> yeah it's reassuring and you go off and you are damage and hurt and you feel pain and you miss them and then everyone's nice to you and yeah. you're allowed to get really drunk and yeah they do that thing where they stroke your head yeah which only happens really when you're a kid yeah but whenever I've been like yeah, I just oh, I love that. Mm. But the the endings, no, I, 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 it's my no, it's too painful because yeah. I don't want to feel. I mean, no one has any agency over anybody, but in that moment when you end a relationship, I think you briefly feel that you do, and that's the worst kind of pain. Yeah, you feel like someone else's emotional well-being is totally, yeah, dependent on you. It's it's awful.
No, I can see why you'd never want another relationship. Yeah. Now we've talked <laughs> yeah. about it. I right? just wonder what the hell any of us are doing. I know, right? But I am I'm romantic and my parents are are madly in love and I want that, you know. So how long have they been together? I guess about 38 years or something. Yeah, and they and they have this movie romance like they I mean, who knows? Behind closed doors. Sure. You know, they sleep in separate beds, but they uh they swear they still have sex all the time and they they just seem re- they're really happy together. They get on well. They every day they play three hours of board games because they, they both work from home. So at, at four p.m. they have a glass of white wine and they play Scrabble and cribbage and uh, for hours. And it does cause arguments, but those are the biggest arguments that they have are about Scrabble because my mom says it's a luck game and my dad says absolutely not. But I he gets all the yeah. vowels. Yeah, it's, I think it's a combination. It's a bit of luck, but then you need to be one of those nerds that just looks for very sort of tiny niche words. Niche words. Yeah. yeah, which I never got. I mean, I love words, but I, I can, I'm terrible at Scrabble. Same, yeah. And, and, and people are embarrassed for me. They're like, how can you, you have a reasonable lexicon. How can you be so shoddy? It's like, because I'm just not into it. I play poker and my family plays poker and they trash talk. My... I'm just at home. My mum called me a cunt. We're, am I allowed to say that? Yeah. We're playing poker. I couldn't Your believe it. Your mother called you a cunt. I couldn't believe it. And then she that's, took all my money. That's woken Ben up. They won, um, they won all my money, my parents. Yeah, but in the, the act, the, the winner doesn't, in the act of winning, you don't call somebody a cunt. It's in the act of losing. Know, she, you have the yeah. most counterintuitive parents I've ever heard of. <laughs> it's just. Yeah, she called me that early in the game, but. Um, yeah, it was very funny. Does she do the whole thing with the visor, the glasses? Does she have like a sort of alter ego when she's playing? They just, are, it's psychological warfare. They're like, um, they start saying from the beginning of the game, I'm, I've am i got two aces, I'm going to win. And they fuck with you and you you get confused. And then every card that they get, they they tell you what it is. They're, it's really, and are they yeah. telling the truth or it depends? Or they just it switch depends. it up? Depends, they switch it up. It's so... You need to do it right back at them. yeah. Uh, the only way that I so ever get anywhere is if I just deal with it. Yeah, <laughs> I just refill their wine glasses, and then and that's the only way I get ahead. Is I stay sharp, and I. I love poker. It's it's the most mercurial, brilliant thing to play. Uh, an ex of mine went in, never played before. There was a proper game going on. You know, one of those ones where there's a ton of cash and everyone's super serious. There were a couple of pros in the room. Wow. And she's like, "What do I do?" So I just give the rough basics. And I go just. Just feel your way cleaned up. Because really? Because she wasn't frightened. And also probably because she, she's unpredictable because yeah. she's never played. She just yeah. thinks it's hilarious. Yeah. She's like, I don't care. I, yeah. don't, I don't know who these people are. I don't know this one's won the, you know, EPT or the whatever. I don't, I don't yeah. care. And it's just like, yeah, I'm all in. And everyone's like, what the? Totally. And it's. I guess it's kind of like how... um. Like, if you're a black belt in karate, you can fight other black belts in karate amazingly well. But if someone comes in just flailing their arms yeah. and with waving a bat, you might... With a jousting pole. With a jousting pole. To your pole. safe space. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Uh, you're welcome. <laughs> but it's but it's like a microcosm of society poker because there's always, as you say, there's always going to be somebody who's not going to play by the rules. Not yeah. going to understand that you want to bet four times the whatever or you know, the, yeah. the multiple thing and the stats and the... So yeah. This one will go, ugh, bored of that. This is a game. And they remind you it's fun. It's supposed to be fun, yeah. Because I've been in poker games where I've just felt so tense. Yeah. I can't understand why I put myself up for it. Yeah. And then money, which I have, I'm not particularly material. I don't, it comes and it goes and whatever and yeah. have it if you want it. Um, suddenly everyone's super tense about money and I notice I'm being tense about it and I don't yeah. like that position either. It's re- When you play, if you run out of chips, can you buy in for more? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's the dangerous bit when you start I go around to my, uh, my ex's house. We were together like, I don't know, a long time ago. And she's married now and her wife plays poker a lot with me aggressively right yeah it's like a lot of our issues are worked out it's like it was a long time ago she loves you she loves you more than anything i'm not i'm not a threat yeah look at me i'm old and tired (laughs) no i have got two kings but it it really makes me laugh it was the whole yeah and and we often play as a three which is a small number for poker but everything's represented that's really funny in that game yeah you could um, write an episode of a sitcom that all takes place around a poker table. You could, yeah. And it everything would be, comes out. There you go. Yeah, it would be. Yeah. It was. It's just a, we, things that we've not been able to explore in the real world just get played out with, yeah. in a card game. I, w- I sort of wished that Justin the Magician had taught me um, some poker-related tricks or um, 
a thing where you throw a card and it can stick in someone's throat or something. Like, I wish he showed me. This is John Wick. Yeah, I know. What the, what the, <laughs> do you sticks in someone's neck? I, I, you know, where you can kill someone with a no. card. <laughs> is that a thing? When, which film have you seen someone being killed with a card? <laughs> yeah, probably some Kill Bill or something. Can I, I just say there's a reason Justin doesn't teach that trick? Yeah. He can't come round for teach 60 murder. quid and go, do you want to murder somebody with the Ace of Spades? Yeah. My niece made me watch, um, what's the one with Mark Ruffalo that's about lots of musician, uh, magicians with Jesse. Oh, yeah. But yeah. I didn't the like Illusionist that so or something. Yeah, like, the yeah. Four Horsemen, and there's some yeah. Woody Harrelson just sort of chewing some scenery and phoning it in. And they're yeah, like, they're like, "We're gonna rob a bank tonight, everybody!" And yeah, I haven't seen that. Are you gonna see the Joker? There's all this controversy. Okay. Talk to what me about What do we the do Joker. about that? I know, I know. It's a film that I've read too much about. Same. Normally, because I am so into that universe, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm at the front of the queue, you know. And I'm into the Joker as a character, and the, I got excited about the trailer, and then all these think pieces started coming out, and then I read that interview with the director being a prick, and I, now I'm, I don't know what to do. Yeah, it's uh, there's been a lot of stuff about it. It's a kind of love letter to incels. And yeah, yeah. The, Maybe like, we watch it when it comes out, so we're not giving money to the cinemas for it. Yes, Watch without adding to the... Imagine the box office is already... That ship has sailed. It's yeah, already true. smashed. <laughs> yeah. And I don't know. You have to look at the the intent behind something and then the reception and they can be yeah. different. Definitely. Although you're saying the director is a prick and maybe had that intent. I don't know. Yeah, he's all anti-woke culture and did this interview oh, yeah. about how comedy's dead and, you know. Which is strange because it's never, never been more... Alive. present and alive and yeah. exciting and yeah I feel that I think so I mean it's cha- complexion wise it's changed for yeah. sure yeah it's a thing that we started off talking about about authenticity so were you in Edinburgh this year did you go as a as I a went tourist? up for a few nights and did an improvised show so you learned some now stuff. That it's all about the authored experience it's yeah we'll do there whereas whereas like maybe 10 years ago there'd be the odd dead dad show which yeah. is <laughs> obviously everyone has to do the dead dad show yeah um now everyone is mining sometimes very traumatic stuff yeah for laughs yeah and i did a panel up there we're talking about comedy and and i i think that you know it will change again but certainly this era will be one where the the, the personal history was everything mm. as opposed to you know when i was starting out it would be the guy coming on stage and literally it would be one man one microphone and he would tell you for an hour the various sexual positions he was enjoying yeah. with his girlfriend and a really high gag ratio like really tons high. of jokes and yeah tons of jokes all observational yeah and no um what's it called what am i what's the word i'm thinking of um like all non sequiturs no um connective yeah, no, no tissue. narrative yeah, 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 yeah. No, exactly no one through yeah. line but it seems to me what observational comedy was doing was going we all do this mm. and trying to find community in that uh and now it's i do this yeah and i find much more universality in the specific. Yeah. So I'll go see a show about somebody who might have been, you know, they were been brought up in Soweto talking yeah. about their experience of racism. But I will find more connection in that, even though I've never experienced racism. And somebody's going, isn't it funny when you go to the laundrette? Yeah, definitely. I don't know what that's about. I guess just empathy and yeah, and and the the more specific stuff you reveal, yeah, you find everybody has has common ground. But I I also am not very good at writing observational comedy, so I'm thrilled. It's a great the way time. It's going. It's a yeah, perfect yeah, yeah. time for you. Well, I love watching it. I really good observational comedy is mind blowing because you think you've said yeah. something that I've always known but never articulated, and it, that's amazing. But then it, it's the same thing with the specific too. You, mm. It's uh, yeah. Do you still watch a lot of it? I mean, do you still go out and see people gigging and? I go. I, I wouldn't go and see just a random mix bill night, but I go. I'll go watch my friends all the time. Yeah, I love. Who do I love? Tom Allen and John Kearns, and there's a handful of people that I'll always see. Um, yeah, I love comedy. And if the, the acting takes off, is this the beginning of you know a whole new? Would you do more? Is that if you got the bug of it now? You kind of. I really loved it, but the problem was that um, my ears turned very red, so. Um, in what situation? Anytime I have to kiss someone. And in fact, talking about it now, you'll see they'll start to go red. Just from me talking about it. I go super red if I... Yeah, I, I get, I get real... I, like, if I go on a date, I'm so red. I literally... Yeah. I'm like, it, it's embarrassing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I feel like I'm having a heart attack. They had to... Like, the makeup lady had to keep 
pausing and then coming in with this paintbrush and like thick foundation on my burning hot red ears. But you knew they went red and you still wrote kissing scenes. Uh, so many kissing scenes. It's a love story. And then, um, and then, so that was humiliating. And then even in the edit, even though I was wearing a thick layer of foundation on my ears, I, we still had to dip into like the VFX budget to tone down no, my ears. Yeah, they like painted it, you in post. They painted my ear, toned them down because they were so red. So I have to get a handle on that. that. There must be some mindfulness, cognitive thing I can do to stop my ears going red. I just, I felt like it would, it's a show about a relationship. And, and I thought it, it would be like a conspicuous omission if the, if there was yeah because if it was a straight couple then and and also I'm looking at the landscape of shows like that now and like Fleabag and Girls and stuff and there's so much sex I thought it would it would be weird if I if I didn't have some in it but yeah it was really um scary <laughs> yeah but you're right it's sort of it is a truth as and also I don't want to seem squeamish about it though but you know what I mean so I felt like I had to but then sitting in the edit and watching myself have sex is I can never I'll never have sex again uh, lights off I'm in it's hell yeah that's full on isn't it it's hu- but you're right you kind of have to do it because it's part of the authenticity of the thing yeah normalize it a bit but um yeah, because... sitting in the edit in general just being watched do you, do you watch yourself on screen god no it's hard right I do some ADR and uh, Mel had gone in two days before and just went silent it was like she just dipped off the radar and it's really? like this never happens it's like she is we are just constantly kind of hive <laughs> mind interconnected one being and I thought something bad's happened yeah really bad and I went in two days later and she texted me on the way and going you welcome to what's happened to us and it was just these enormous fucking screen with my enormous fucking face on it I was oh going my in my head because I behave like a 17 year old yeah I, in my, I appreciate life like a 17 year old I have noticed that the edifice is so cataclysmically kind of collapsed As and there it, it hasn't, was it, hasn't it was not. just like Christ and I, I couldn't even start the ADR session I said I have to phone <laughs> Miggins I was like going now I understand she's going look at my face look at my face I'm like, look at my face What's that? and that's all we did until they wheeled me back into the studio to kind of provide lines but oh, I God. hate it so yeah. I will if I do a documentary thing I will like I'll script it but I will just say just drop me in five seconds before so that I will yeah. just do just do that bit because I don't want to see what happens before I don't want to yeah and also because I'm I'm endlessly I I don't remember things from the past I'm so in the moment yeah that I just want to be on to the next thing so it's like I don't want to catch what I did a year ago or six months ago yeah that makes sense this is exciting now and everything is of interest and yeah which is profoundly annoying for anyone near me but (laughs) no I'm not a fan I would say a dog doesn't return to its own vomit and that's how I feel about my work oh my god you know I kind of if everyone else says it's okay and I've I've employed those people where I work with those people and trust them yeah that's good enough for me yeah that makes sense but but sometimes I think it does make me a you know, I think it's good you were in your own edit and you, you gave it that because you it's your project. Yeah. And you have to author every moment of it. I just can't painful. believe that that's what, how my face moves when I talk and how I, how I walk and yeah. But I, I guess I did become desensitized to it by the end, but it took, I mean, it was months of like not breathing and just sitting, but um, yeah. So you get that. So which was the most rewarding part, the writing because they say it's a it's a third each, isn't it? The show is made mm. writing, performing, and then editing. Which was the favorite bit for you? I thought I'd love the edit, but I hated the edit. But um, no, I think I think filming it was was amazing. And I wrote it with my best friend Joe, who's a really nice boy, and <laughs> we had a really good time. We watched The Chase every day on I our lunch break. Chase. Love The Chase, and um, you know, just ate good food and hung out at my flat and played games, and it was great. And then um, yeah, filming was amazing. It had yeah, lots of friends in it, and it was incredible. I mean, it's what you dream of. I dreamed about it since I was five, you know. So it, I just tried to be in the moment and and take a step back and think how incredible it, and lucky I am. And did you manage to do that in in, no. in achieving? <laughs> no, 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 no. I was in floods of tears all the time. Uh, no, I cried. A, I cried a bit from fear. Did you? Just like quietly in my trailer, I'd be like, "Cool, guys, I'm just gonna have a quick uh, make a phone call and then go have a little cry." I was very overwhelmed and scared. I was in like every scene and just like, I don't know how I'm doing. And you just don't know if you're doing well at all. It's like uh, when, when I do it, because I don't, do, don't act very often, but 
the language is so different. Yeah. And you don't really understand what they're talking about. And it's like you, you, you've just arrived in Portugal and everyone's having a conversation and laughing and you're like, I'm just, I have no idea what you're talking about. Totally. Shot sizes and lenses and... Yeah, I remember doing one thing and then the director was basically saying, okay, she was like, okay, great, let's go again this time. Can you do it like better kind of? <laughs> or is that... Or can you do it hotter or something? And I just had this panic rising. So I was like, I've just done it the best I can possibly yeah. do it. And I don't know what you mean. I don't know how to be hotter. <laughs> you know? it's, or, but it's, it's, it's kind of, I, there's something inauthentic in essence about acting. And yeah. if you've tried, and, and, and yet this story is an authentic representation of parts of your psyche. So those two things yeah. are like attacking one another. Yeah. It's like, I feel that when I'm acting is like, I will have a, what I feel is a truthful experience, but really mm. I'm only having it as Sue. I'm not having it as this supposed, you know, yeah, weird, this supposed character that's supposedly in love with this other character. And absolutely, very strange. And I don't want to go there because I don't want to really fall in love with an actor because that's terrible. Yeah, yeah and yeah. of course that is what happens. Is like some people just they fall in love. Order, yeah, they they just they just do it. I think you have to fall in love in the moment, and then you have to build up a little brick wall at the end of the day. I can't wait to see a show. So you think Thanks. February? I think February and March. Yeah, on Channel 4 here and Netflix everywhere else. And, and then what's it called? It's called Feel Good, because that's what I'm trying to do all the time. That sounds perfect. Find a way to feel good. Yeah. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. It's been so nice to talk to you. I'm such a huge fan. So Likewise. I'm forever. very honoured. Don't be silly. But it's, it's been <laughs> wonderful. Thank you. Thanks, Sue. Thanks for listening. Uh, as always, you can post reviews at Apple Podcasts. Uh, you can post abuse to my Twitter feed at Sue Perkins. All are welcome. All the music in this episode was provided by Waiting for Smith. And if you want to check out more Waiting for Smith, then go to Spotify. I'll be there if you want me to. When the marble has turned to clay, and the people have all turned grey, and the Romans don't walk so slow. I'll be there if you want me to. I'll be there if you want.